So thank you for the uh, introduction. So I want to thank Mark and uh, Sandro for their kind uh, invitation to this uh, wonderful and intense week of uh, mathematics in the, and also in this uh, new museum with new buildings and so on. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, so I'm uh, going to present, uh, so I'm going to spend half of my talk explaining and motivating uh, this uh, Frisch Parisi conjecture and the second half of uh, the talk uh, will be, uh, I mean, to explain how we solve it. And the third part, the third half of the talk <laughs> uh, will be, uh, will contain the proof. Uh, so, well, um, so um, this is, I just want to mention that there will, uh, so this is a joint work with uh, Julien Barral uh, from uh, Paris North. So, uh, Let's, so my purpose here is first to describe uh, the uh, local regularity of functions and measures. This will be my purpose uh, today. So what I mean by that is I'm investigating the roughness of a signal, an image, a function, sample path or stochastic processes, or a measure around a given point, uh, but for uh, simultaneously for all points. So, Examples uh, are given here, for instance, so you can look at this Fourier series, which is quite uh, famous, uh, proposed by Riemanns uh, long time ago as a possible example of a non-differentiable, uh, continuous but non-differentiable functions, and it took almost 120 years to prove that, uh, I mean, to complete its complete, to complete its full uh, local regularity analysis. You, are also aware of this, uh, what uh, Bernoulli measure is. So uh, one is in, uh, I'm interested in describing the local fluctuations of this function or this measure. And this is a kind of question that appears also in turbulence. So here is the velocity of a fluid, uh, in a, uh, turbulent fluid uh, in, a, in a tube. Here, is, here are two uh, brain signals that you can see that not only they are not regular, but also their local regularity is moving with time, is changing. So we want to analyze uh, these signals, and the same happens for uh, image and texture. So, so what is the, I mean, I give some uh, definitions, start with some simple, very simple definitions. So um, I, if f is a locally bounded function, uh, alpha positive and x zero, a given point, then, I, the function f belongs to C alpha, so it's a functional space, C alpha at x zero. If locally, I mean, so it's very uh, natural definition, simple, f of x minus f of x zero is bounded by x minus x zero to the alpha. So it's really locally holder. And for x close to x zero, and when alpha is greater than one, you replace the value here by a polynomial, which essentially is the Taylor polynomial of the function. So f of x minus uh, this polynomial is bounded by x minus x zero to the alpha. So you know, again, we're trying to quantify the local variation of the function. And if alpha is great, then the greater alpha, the closer f to a polynomial locally. And so f is a uh, yeah, so smoother f, but it's really a local notion. So, uh, once we have this, we are interested in, a, in an index. So this index is called the pointwise holder exponent. So it's the supremum of the alphas such that uh, f belongs to C alpha. So it's somehow the, the smallest uh, envelope that contains locally the graph of the function. And it describes the local, uh, describes the local, distribution, uh, local fluctuation of the function. So what we theoretically want to do is to compute this uh, exponent uh, for every point, but uh, most of the time it's not possible even for, um, you know, for mathematical models or for data. And so it's rather, uh, it's more relevant to not exactly to compute the exponent at every point, but more to um, uh, find the range of these expo exponents 
and also the distribution of these exponents, how many points have a given exponent. So that's why we uh, focus on what's called the multifractal spectrum that many of you uh, know. So first, for we F being fixed, we consider the level sets of the Hölder exponent, so the C, this set EF of H, the set of points at which the exponent is equal to H. And next, we compute the Hausdorff dimension of this set. Okay, so we, give, we obtain a map, which is called this multifractal spectrum. You give me H, I give you the Hausdorff dimension. So it's, uh, so again, D is the Hausdorff dimension. And doing this, we, of course, we describe geometrically the, geometrically the distribution of the singularities of the function. So it may look like this, a multifractal spectrum. Means that you have a, an exponent h, and sometimes you have a, a value which is less than d, the dimension of the space, and which is the dimension of the level sets, the level sets of these uh, exponents. Sometimes it's minus infinity, meaning that the level set is empty. Okay, and for reasons that I will uh, explain, uh, one accepts, one expects that the uh, house of the, the multifractal spectrum, this map has this concave shape or uh, um, degenerate concave shape, something with a slope, uh, either linear or fine, uh, increasing. So that's what I'm going to explain. Uh, let me just say that everything works, works similarly for measures. Uh, so if you consider, let's say, probability measure, but uh, we can do that for any kind of measure, actually. So, uh, in you, uh, well, in, in, so, so this is the local dimension of the measure. I don't need to explain, everybody knows this. And so I have the same iso holder sets. Uh, so the set of points at which the local dimension is h. So let me just focus, uh, mention that uh, I use a limit exponent so that this quantity is defined at every point. And the multifractal spectrum is the same uh, mapping, and one has the same uh, heuristics that I will explain now. The only difference between uh, functions and measures is that, I mean, it's a, it's a good exercise, as someone said, for good, uh, for good uh, master student, I would say. Uh, it's uh, the, uh, for measures, the uh, Hausdorff, the multifractal spectrum is always below the diagonal. So, so except from this, I mean, all the two notions are uh, absolutely comparable. So before going to the explaining the formalisms, I need to uh, introduce also uh, the wavelet tools. And then after that, I'm done with the definitions, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, it's still uh, important. So what is a wavelet? So a wavelet is a smooth function with vanishing integral. So that's why it's called a wavelet. And uh, either rapid decay, like it's a Mayer's wavelet, for instance, or compact support. And from psi, this function, you, so, so you built a family, so indexed by two uh, integers, psi, j, k. So j, k, and two integers. So uh, it's just a delayed and translated version of psi. Okay, you see, with only one function, you obtain a family. And I also denote by i, j, k, the dyadic interval, centered at k to the minus j of uh, generation j. And uh, so, as, a, as I said, so somehow psi is located around zero and uh, at, has a sort of frequency one, let's say, it's a base, base, basic function. And psi j, k, so it's now concentrated around this dyadic point with this transformation and in frequency around two to the j because of, uh, of uh, this um, uh, de de delayed version. And the thing is, the important thing is that what has been proved by uh, Mala, Meyer, and uh, Meyer, and so on, is that if you choose uh, suitably the function psi, then all these uh, translated di and dilated version when renormalized, they form an Il Hilbert basis of L2. And so uh, this means that any function f can be decomposed in a sum like that, where the djk here, they are the wavelet coefficients of the function that simply the coordinates of the function f in the uh, Hilbert uh, basis. And so this is a multi-scale decomposition of the function. 
And the idea that you should keep in mind is that the, this DJK, this coefficient, it describes essentially the frequential uh, content of the function around the, uh, this dyadic point. Okay, so the, I mean, these are essentially the two notions that I will try to combine uh, later, the wavelet coefficients and the local regularity. So why do we use wavelets? Okay, so first, it's because I like wavelets, and I've been working in wavelets with wavelets a long time ago, so it's a, it's a nice tool. And the second one is because it, this is the Jean Morlet Chair Conference, and Jean Morlet was the inventor of the wavelets, so it seemed natural to talk a little bit about wavelets uh, uh, at some point this week. Uh, okay, but there are other reasons. For instance, there are rapid algorithms to compute the wavelet coefficients on data. Uh, it exists in any dimension. It can be adapted to the problem you're looking at, whatever the problem is. And it's a very useful tool when analyzing the local regularity uh, of a function. And uh, this is essentially due to the following uh, things. So this is really easy to check, again, for a good student. Uh, so if F is global, <coughs> globally C alpha, uh, uh, holder uh, regularity, then the wavelet coefficient have an exponential decay of order alpha. So it's really like the, the Fourier coefficients, for instance. And uh, also, Bezov spaces are characterized by wavelets, so I will come back to this later. And uh, it's also, so maybe don't look at the formula, but it's uh, uh, the, the pointwise holder exponent is also characterized by wavelet coefficients, meaning if you give me the wavelet coefficients, I can compute the uh, pointwise holder exponent of the function at every F and the intuition, well, maybe not the formula, but the intuition is important. It, it says that if you, so it, when you're interested in the local reality of F at X0, then if X0 is close to a, uh, so, uh, to a large wavelet coefficient, so you know these wavelet coefficients are located around dyadic points, so if, if X0 is, cl is close to a large wavelet coefficients, then the regularity of F is very poor. So here you can guess that there will be some connection with Diophantine approximation because uh, uh, X0 needs to be close to dyadic numbers infinitely many times. Uh, every J and K, no, no, not exactly. I mean, uh, we, we need, for instance, uh, K and, so, uh, a, K to, the, K to the minus J, which is a dyadic number, must be, must be at, distance, at distance less than one, okay. than, X zero, than, than uh, to, to X zero. So, so it's not exactly for every J and K. For every J and K, so that uh, everything is, uh, because we are working with local quantities. Okay, so now I'm moving to this uh, formalism uh, question. So, so here, everybody, most of you know about thermodynamical formalism. And, and so here, we will talk about this multifractal formalism, which, I mean, the two notions coincide in uh, uh, various settings. But it's also interesting to uh, see that this notion of formalism arises um, in a different context. And here, it's uh, flu um, fluid mechanics. So Frisch and Parisi are also, so Giorgio, um, Uriel Frisch and Frisch in Giorgio Parisi are also famous at CIRM because they uh, came here uh, very uh, many, many, many times. And uh, so they are physicists working in, a, in a, um, uh, fluid mechanics. And so they are, they are uh, uh, trying to describe the velocity of a fluid. Uh, so we are working in a bounded domain of, uh, let's say, of, uh, of volume one. And so in order to do this, they try to describe, as many of us, many of you, uh, the, the local uh, fluctuation of this velocity. So they uh, study these, the, the moments of this fluctuation. So sorry, T, T is, is not a time, T is a power, okay? And so the, they um, look at this integral and, for instance, uh, Depending on the model you choose, uh, so this has, can behave differently, but for real data and for many models, when L tends to zero, this has a scaling behavior. This, beha this behaves as a power of L, and so this power is, is called zeta V of T, and so as a function, zeta V of T is called the scaling function associated with V. 
So for instance, Kolmogorov he, um, modeled the, this, uh, the local fluctuation by a fractional Brownian motion. And in this case, you can see that zeta v of t is linear. But for real data, numerical experiments have shown that actually uh, zeta v is always nonlinear as a, in a concave function. And the uh, heuristics by Frisch and Paris in the 80s was that this nonlinearity is explained by the multifractality of the velocity. Multifractality means that you have different local behaviors, a lot of different local behaviors. And I so make a proof. I mean, a physician proof. I'm sorry, there's a physicist here. Uh, okay, so for instance, so at all points at which the exponent of v is h. So you have this uh, local increment uh, estimate, v of x plus l minus v of x is l to the h. You, are, you have your bounded domain of uh, volume one, you cut it into small cubes of size l, and since the dimension of e v of h is supposed to be uh, strictly positive, you can say that there are approximately l to the minus dimension number of cubes of size l co which contain uh, points x at which this estimate is true, okay? So going back to this uh, moment, I replace the integral of the increments by the sum of all possible exponents. V of x plus L minus V of x, it's L to the H, so it gives L to the TH. This is the number of cubes, and this is the, uh, the volume of every cube, okay? So you, you replace everything. And so you get the sum of over all possible exponent h of this quantity, and this is something that many of you met um, in your career. You know that when l tends to zero, the greatest contribution is obtained for the smallest exponent. And so this is a Legendre transform, and by inverse Legendre transform, you get that the multifractal spectrum uh, must be concave, and also the uh, Legendre transform of the scaling function. So this, uh, this, is, this is local quantities and this is some statistical uh, properties built, uh, computed on the, on, the, um, on, the, on, the, on the function. And, and this is, uh, well, really a strong intuition. And despite the number of crude approximations that have been made along the, along the computation, this formula happens to be true for most of the mathematical models that we can build. And so what I call multifractal formalism, it's any formula that relates my multifractal spectrum, the one that I introduced before, to the Legendre transform of some scaling function. And the scaling function can be something like that, but actually this is very bad. I mean, it just take a few minutes and a few computations to see that it's not stable at all. That's not exactly, not, you don't want to compute with that. One other definition can be just the sum of the wavelet coefficients. You fix the generation J, the frequency, and you sum over space, and you get the second, second uh, formula. And there are many formulas based on wavelets. I will not um, elaborate on this, but it's absolutely important because, of course, when you have data, then you cannot measure the multifractal spectrum. But if you suppose that the underlying model that gave birth to the data satisfy a multifractal formalism, then you can access these quantities by log-log plots. So that's what people do. So this is, for instance, the velocity. You get an estimate like this. These are textures. These are, uh, so I'm working with a neurologist and a neuroscientist. These are two brain, uh, two brains. Well, that does not look like brain, but it's, it is a brain. Uh, and you can see, depending on, on whether the patient is active or resting, the, uh, the response is different. And uh, we also uh, talk <coughs> often in mathematics about these one million dollar questions. So here it's a Van Gogh painting, and there, the, there, there was a sort of they were not sure that whether it was or not uh, a, a painting by Van Gogh, and so they used a lot of uh, methods, including uh, including a multifractal method, but also Fourier method, and determining whether a painting is Van Gogh or not. It's more like a hundred million uh, dollars question, uh, and so on. So. So that's for, uh, let, let's go back now to the math, math results on that. So I recall that uh, property is typical. 
when uh, in a bare space when the set of elements of E uh, satisfying this property is the residual set. And so what we are able to prove, so this is a result, we proved that with Zoltan Bugzolich and it was extended by Frederick Bayard to all compact sets, is that typical probability measures on a compact set are multifractal. And we are also, so they satisfy a multifractal formalism and their uh, multifractal spectrum is linear. Okay. So it goes somehow against the intuition that all these multifractal properties are exceptional. And may maybe you should think the other way. When you're not multifractal, then that means something. Um, and it's also the case in Bezov spaces. And if you take, uh, so if you don't know what Bezov space is, it's a Sobolev space. You know, well, if you don't know what a Sobolev space is, then you should know. <laughs> you should know. <laughs> Jérôme said it, I did not. Uh, and so a typical function in the Bezov space also are multifractal with a multifractal spectrum, spectrum linearly increasing or a fine increasing. We studied many typical situations, typical convex compositions, functions in the Heidelberg group. There are also many results on prevalence, prevalency of multifractals. But, okay. Here are the math results. Here are the uh, observed data. And uh, okay, you, so I think now you can guess the question uh, because here there are two main differences. The one there, there is always a decreasing part that is observed in reality, which is never uh, present in the theoretical, uh, in the math uh, functions, typical math functions. And so that, that means that here, so you see, when there is the, the highest the point, the most frequent one, so it means that for all the functions that we meet, the largest regularity is also the most frequent ones. <coughs> and uh, this is not the case in reality. I mean, for a picture, they are, you, you have smooth regions, and, uh, and it's, it's not the most of them. So the conjecture that was uh, written somehow by Frisch and Parisi and reformulated by Stéphane Jaffard is that if you, uh, if you give me any concave reasonable function, there should be a functional space in which typical functions have these multifractal spectrum. And so, but yeah, so the, the answer is yes, to be short. Uh, so for every admissible function, there exists a bare space of functions in which typical functions have the prescribed multifractal spectrum. And these functions, they satisfy the, somehow the best multifractal formalism that, that, that can be. And I will try to explain that very uh, shortly. So uh, the rest of the talk is I give this definition of this functional space and I will try to convince you that they are very natural. And uh, uh, we are, uh, we'll make some connection with uh, dynamical systems and, uh, well, and uh, explain the rest in a few remaining time. So before Bezov spaces in multifractal environment, I just go back to Bezov spaces. So Bezov spaces, it's, uh, so as I said, essentially it's like a Sobolev space. You, well, it's functions that have S derivatives in LP. And another natural, very simple way to describe them is to consider for a given function, the finite difference operator, so it's delta H. So f of x plus h minus, uh, minus f of x, and you iterate it n times, you get this, uh, uh, this um, uh, function. And from this function, you build a modulus of continuity. So you take the LP norm of this function uh, over uh, zero one, uh, to the, over the cube, and you take the supremum of this for all t's between, uh, for all h's between t and t over two, and so that's the modulus of continuity. Just to write it properly, if I take n equal to one, then I am back to the initial formula by Frisch and Parisi, except that now we have some mathematical stability to compute it. And uh, yeah, just to say that n plays no role here. Essentially, I take n very large, and, uh, and that's all. And so I have this modulus of, of continuity and the, and the Bezov space is simply the set of functions be, so that belong to LP. So, that, so if you consider the modulus of continuity at uh, the uh, powers of two, so omega n f2 minus j, 
then uh, they decrease at a, cert at a certain speed. That's, that's uh, just what it is. So when you renormalize by 2 to the j s minus d over p, so this quantity is always positive, then it's an LQ sequence. So that's the space, the, the buzz of space. Any function satisfying this is in B, belongs to BSPQ. And the important thing is that we have a wavelet characterization. So every function uh, in BSPQ uh, can be characterized by its wavelet coefficients. Essentially, this, so it's this series, so it's a sum of a K. D, so again, this is a wavelet coefficient that you renormalize. And this should be an LP sequence. Uh, no, yeah, this should be an LP sequence, but this AG is an LQ sequence. If you don't like uh, this uh, tuning parameter Q, you just, okay, we can take Q equal to infinity and just say, okay, this is bounded for every J, okay? And now, okay, so this is, uh, this is, uh, this is the definition. Now we modify just a little bit the difference by introducing some uh, environment. So I take new uh, capacity, so well, capacity is just a decreasing function of sets. So if i is, is smaller than i prime, mu of i is less than mu of i prime, and maybe you should think of mu as a measure, probability measure. And I just uh, introduced this notation, b of xy is the smallest ball that contains uh, x and y. And I replace the difference uh, oper operator by, so by, uh, so delta NH, but I divide by mu of the ball that contains X and X plus NH. So once, so that's the only modification I do. So I, I introduce some uh, distortion of um, space, if you want. And once I, I do this, then I have a new modulus of continuity I do not change anything else. And I have a new, uh, I have a new base of space, except that now I require that this is this quantity that converges. So I do not change a lot of things, but uh, I introduce some heterogeneity. In particular, if I take mu as a power of Lebesgue, then uh, with a suitable exponent, then I recover the initial set. So it's a very natural extension. Okay, that's my new space. So it's a, um, what I would like to uh, explain you is what happens if I take from you a Gibbs measure. So, uh, so here, uh, most of you, uh, well, there have been some uh, recalls about this. So I take a Holder potential the, on, on the cube, the Birkhoff sums associated with the uh, shift and this potential. And it's a uh, well, folklore theorem that there exists a Gibbs measure that describes essentially the asymptotic uh, growth of the, um, these uh, Birkhoff sums, right? And what is important for me is that this Gibbs measure, it's doubling and it satisfies the multifractal formalism, okay? So it's very, uh, well, folklore theorem. So may, I did not say exactly what the multifractal formalism for measure is, but uh, okay, it's, it's been a recall this morning. So if for any uh, measure mu, I, I compute this uh, uh, scaling function, so it's tau mu of q. In the case of gift measures, it's uh, this converges. And uh, tau mu is a re real analytic, and the theorem is that such a measure uh, satisfies the multifractal formalism and the multifractal spectrum of uh, these kind of measures uh, has typically this shape. And uh, the, the value of the spring exponents are uh, related to the derivatives of the scaling function. So it's a very famous theorem. If you don't know about it, just recall that these measures, is really, these measures are really nice and they satisfy the formalism. And in this, in this case, we can do almost everything. For instance, we can prove that uh, these, function, these function spaces are characterized by wavelet coefficients. And uh, you, so maybe I showed, this was the formula for the um, base of spaces. So now we just replace this formula, which is the same for every k. Now we have something which depends on k. So we introduce some uh, um, non-homogeneity in the, in, the, in the definition. And it's really nice because uh, we, are, we like to work with wavelet coefficient, as I explained. And again, if you, 
take mu as the Lebesgue uh, power uh, with a good exponent, then uh, the two formula coincide. And it's very important because, of course, as I said, uh, working with wavelet coefficients allows to make specific construction and estimate and so on. And uh, yeah, just no, no other comment than this formula. Yeah, this really looks like a Sobolev space, except that uh, we put some measure there, and there could be some uh, nice analysis based on these uh, uh, new uh, functional spaces. Uh, why is, is that a multi, why, why do we call that a multifractal environment? It's because essentially AG, a, AG, this, a, AJ, sorry, the, this uh, second must be bounded. So it means that every wavelet coefficient is bounded by the measure. You give you the measure at the beginning, and it puts constraints on the maximal value of the wavelet coefficients everywhere, but not the same ones. It depends on where you are. Okay, and so the theorem. So don't look at the formulas. Please, I wrote it just to be complete, but don't look at them, just look at the results. It said we are able to bound the multifractal uh, spectrum for any function in this space, and we are also able to prove, to compute the multifractal spectrum for typical functions, and to prove that it satisfies a sort of multifractal formalism. And, uh, okay, uh, so, so this is the theorem, but I would like to show pictures to explain the theorem, it's better. So for instance, when P, the parameter P is infinite, then we build function which, has, which have the same multifractal spectrum as the environment. So that's nice, we have sort of correspondence. Uh, but when P is less than plus infinity, there is an implicit formula given the, the, the spectrum that we are able to compute and to describe very properly. And this is what it gives. So in dashed points here, the dashed curve is the uh, uh, multifractal spectrum of the environment, the, this uh, measure mu. This is the upper bound true for any function uh, in our Bezos space. And this is the typical multifractal spectrum in this space. In the case of uh, plus infinity, and what happens if we make P decrease is a sort of a, yeah, a distortion of the spectrum with a, we have many phenomena appearing everywhere. It's a, not a, an easy analysis. And also we can, I mean, with playing with parameters, we can make this spectrum move. Uh, um, yeah, and so, so somehow adapt the shape of the, of the spectrum to what we want. And just in a two minutes, just key steps in the proof. First, we built a sort of saturation function. A saturation function is a function which has the greatest, uh, the largest uh, possible wavelet coefficient. So somehow we saturate all the, uh, all the coefficients here. So it's quite easy when you take the L infinity norm because you just, uh, yeah, you, 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 you put uh, djk equal to mu of ijk, and you put a factor. But it's much more complicated when p is less than one, and so you must find a way to distribute very uh, uniformly, uh, but uh, yeah, in a smart way, uh, the large weights. And here you, uh, well, absolutely some uh, Diophantine approximation ideas ideas are needed to distribute the weight. And then we make the local analysis of, of F, and it's a it's very complicated issue because this, uh, in, this, in these typical functions, there are a lot of oscillating phenomena, which are called like chirps, and detect, detecting chirps by wavelet techniques is an important issue because, for instance, as you know, gravitational waves are ex exactly uh, uh, chirps that are detected by uh, wavelets techniques. So we are within this kind of, um, uh, I would say, environment of uh, kind of questions. And for instance, we are also facing um, deep questions in uh, metric number theory. Uh, like, so maybe just read this blue question, which is uh, not easy. If you take a sequence of balls, B of xn ln, where ln goes to zero, what is the dimension of this limb sup, of uh, the limb sup of these balls, when you, when, you restrict, when, when you restrict to the balls which have a given 
scaling behavior for the measure. And this is uh, not an easy issue uh, on which uh, many uh, people have been uh, working. And now everything. So I have, what, five minutes, something like that? Yes. Yeah. And so at the end, what am, am I doing? So once I have this uh, function with the most uh, typical uh, behavior, I try to perturbate it and uh, I mean, if you already worked and already tried to build a residual set uh, in, in a bare space, I mean, it's a standard technique uh, that we apply at the end. Uh, I said uh, most of the work is more uh, at the beginning. Okay, so somehow we would have uh, solved, solved the problem if we were able to construct a Gibbs measure with a prescribed multifractal spectrum, right? Uh, because the question was, I give me a function and I, I provide you with a functional space in which the typical functions have the, you know, the behavior that you observe. And actually this inverse problem for Gibbs measure is it's not known. We, 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 we are not able to do that in the reverse sense. And so there are previous results, but not with a complete answer. And so uh, that's why we sort of uh, uh, Im improved our results, but not completely solved the question. So the, the, what we are able to show is that you give me a possible spectrum that is something uh, concave mapping uh, with a bounded support and uh, which is something which is reasonable to be a spectrum then I'm we are able to build an almost, not a doubling measure, but an almost doubling measure, uh, which satisfies the multifractal formalism, which has full support in the cube, and has exactly S as multifractal spectrum. And we are not able to drop this uh, almost doubling uh, uh, assumption. So what is almost doubling? Maybe I should say, so, so doubling, uh, everybody knows. And almost doubling is that we add something uh, exponential of theta of r, where theta is something really small. And, and the other bound here it is not exactly uh, trivial because we are not only working with measures, but we also working with capacities. So um, functions mu, which are not, no, not necessarily decreasing. And so, you, we, we, with this, we start the, we see the building a little bit shivering because uh, the fact that the measure was doubling, the Gibbs measure was doubling, was absolutely essential in all the uh, works that I, the results that I presented. And so we tried to put everything together, but uh, now this space B mu PQ, when we consider our measures or our capacities, uh, are well defined, but not independent of the wavelet, of the wavelet choice. And uh, it's not exactly true that uh, we can do some, well, uh, the same analysis. And so uh, at the end, what we do is we, the, the good space is something like that. So in, it's an, uh, we, instead of mu itself, we uh, consider these, uh, we multiply mu by uh, Lebesgue measures. Uh, powers of Lebesgue measures, and we have new uh, spaces which are, which are intersections of uh, Bezov spaces, uh, and the theorem gathering everything, so here I'm, I'm going fast, I know, uh, but the theorem is, the, is as follows. If you uh, if we consider a function S that is concave, compactly supported with a maximum equal to D, then there exists a bare topological space B, which has this form, uh, in which typical functions have the uh, uh, multifractal uh, behavior that we expect, and they satisfy a multifractal formalism. And uh, uh, yeah, so I'm uh, right on time. Just, I mean, the proof here is three lines, but uh, of course it's, uh, it's not exactly like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, let me just say that we are quite happy with this construction, but it's not, I mean, it's, so it was an important first step, but uh, also what we uh, want to do is to 
prove that this kind of property would be uh, conserved by, let's say, uh, partial differential equations or systems uh, that evolve in time, not only in one uh, given uh, functional space. And so this is the next steps that we are working on, uh, proving that not only this uh, space are, um, I would say, well-defined, but that one, that one can also uh, use them in the uh, local regularity analysis of uh, many uh, physical systems. Okay, thank you.